Welcome everyone. It's a real pleasure to be welcoming Miles Steiner to give us our seminar today. So Miles will be known to some of you. He was the awards chair at last year's PBSC. So if anybody won an award, you want to buy Miles beer. This year he's going to be the publications chair. So he's going to be chasing you all for your papers for the IEEE PBSC. But Miles is visiting us as a Fulbright scholar it's a program that's allowed Miles to visit us from January through to the middle of April. So we're about halfway through here. And so if, so if you don't know Miles, then I think this presentation is going to be very informative for you. Uh, if you do know Miles, well, you've got another couple of weeks left to have some fun conversations with him. So Miles joined NREL in 2006, where he's been working on a number of topics in 3.5 photovoltaics. In particular, some, something we've been particularly keen on is radiative coupling between subcells in multi-junction devices. Before joining NREL, Miles did his PhD in superconductivity at Stanford U U University. So he's an example of someone who's come from another very interesting area, superconductivity, moved into photovoltaics. So Miles, we're delighted to have you visiting us and really looking forward to your talk. 47% efficiency in a six junction concentrator solar cell. Miles. Thank you. Thank you for the warm introduction and thank you for having me here. Um, as Ned said, I, I got this scholarship by the Fulbright Commission, which is a program of the US Department of State to, uh, to come here um, on a sabbatical like leave from NREL. And, um, it w so I've been working with Ned and, and uh, Michael and Andreas and other students and postdocs uh, on radiative efficiency and quantum well solar cells, which has been a lot of fun. Um, that's not what I'm going to talk about today, um, but it's been a pleasure being here. So, so thank you very much for hosting me. And um, like Ned said, I'll be here through mid-April. Um, so I'd love to have conversations with others in the room. So I'm going to talk about um, our 47% efficient six junction cell, which is work that we've been doing at NREL for past three and a half years. Uh, and before that, you know, we worked on four junction cells, and before that three junction cells and two junctions. So we've been working on this for, you know, 20 some years at NREL. And uh, this is the culmination of, of a lot of that work. Um, you can see some of the people who have contributed. This is a project led by John Geis um, with participation from a lot of different scientists and technicians and uh, postdocs and students uh, at NREL and, and outside. Um, so I don't want to presume people's uh, background or knowledge of multi-junctions. So uh, I'm going to start with some kind of basics about 3.5s. I know that this is a largely silicon community. 3.5s um, in multi-junctions, MOCVD, which is a growth technique. And then I'll talk at some length about metamorphic epitaxy. And finally, our 6J IMM results. All right, so there are several losses in the solar cell. But I think we can agree that the two most fundamental ones are that uh, photons that are um, Lower energy than the band gap do not get absorbed. They go right through. And photons that have energy in excess of the band gap uh, are lost to thermalization. All right? These are the two biggest losses. And so if one wants to increase the efficiency of a single junction solar cell, what can we do? So a single junction solar cell, right? you trade off between voltage and current. If you start with a low band gap cell, then you pick up a lot of current, but you have a low voltage, and thus a low power. If you have a very high band gap cell, you have uh, a very high voltage because your thermalization loss is low, but you lose most of the power because most of those photons are unabsorbed. And somewhere in the middle, you have you know, an optimum silicon guy marcenide. How do you go beyond that? Well, you try to address these two fundamental losses. So you try to extend the range of absorption, and you try to divide that absorption into smaller bands to reduce the thermalization losses. Make sense? So one can imagine a single junction cell with an optimal band gap here I've just shown, you know, for example, a beautiful QE uh, for gallium arsenide, and it, it captures some fraction of the solar spectrum with some voltage, and you get an efficiency. If you divide that into two, if you make a gallium indium phosphide gallium arsenide tandem, then you reduce the thermalization losses for the same amount of total absorption, and your efficiency goes up. If you add a third junction with a much lower band gap, you've increased the range of absorption. You pick up voltage from that third junction, and so your efficiency goes up. And then if you divide that long wavelength third junction into two, you reduce those thermalization losses and your efficiency goes up. All right, so we've built up from a single junction to a four junction device. We've expanded the range of absorption and we've sectioned it into four bins to reduce thermalization losses. And in this way, the multi-junction has uh, an efficiency that exceeds that of a single junction cell. All right, 
So how do you do this in, pra in practice? You put the highest band gap cell on top, followed by the next highest band gap cell on the lowest band gap cell on the bottom, so that the light that is uh, transparent to the top cell gets collected by the second junction and so on. And there are lots of models in the literature. Some of them are accurate. Um, this is uh, the model you know, of the efficiency versus the number of junctions. You can see that it goes up as a function of, of the number of junctions. Um, it'll keep going up. It starts to roll over. But you know, clearly, as you add number of junctions, uh, your efficiency goes up. OK, so we're going to just construct this out of three fives. And for those who have forgotten what the periodic table looks like, this is a snapshot of part of it. So you know, silicon is in the middle in column four. The three fives are made from elements in groups three and group five of the periodic table. Um, the most prominent group three elements are aluminum, gallium, and indium. I have never seen a, a three five solar cell made of thallium. But um, you know, if, if you're looking for new research ideas, you could try. Uh, on the group five side, phosphorus and arsenic was prominent. We also use antimony sometimes, bismuth once in a while. So why the three fives? What's attractive about them? Well, it's a very, very useful material system for constructing multi-junctions. So this is a, a map of the band gap as a function of lattice constant. You see all the binaries. And then the white lines connect the binaries and form ternary compositions. Okay? So first of all, you can make very highly crystalline material out of the three fives. We make large area crystals. Um, you, know, you can grow over a six inch wafer, not at NREL, but one could grow industrial over a six inch wafer with very good crystallinity across the whole surface. Um, there is an opportunity for a lot of lattice matching. So any two points that are um, vertically connected, they're vertically at the same lattice constants, right? you can grow one on top of each other in principle with good epitaxial uh, quality. Uh, they're all direct band gaps. There's a wide range of band gaps. You can dope them n-type and p-type. Um, and that's you know, to be distinguished from some other material systems, for example, the nitrides, which have a tough time doping p-type, for example. And so you know, one can make confinement layers. It's very stable. It's got all the ingredients one wants to construct um, a solar cell. Um, this piece about lattice matching is especially important. So if you look here, the middle dot is gallium arsenide, which is a widely available substrate. And then above it is gallium indium phosphide that has the same lattice constant. And below it is germanium. And the fact that germanium and gallium arsenide are aligned is kind of serendipitous. But uh, one can therefore construct a three junction device at the same lattice constant with good epitaxy. And so this triple junction, gallium indium phosphide, gallium arsenide, germanium, has, uh, has been in production in the space industry since about the mid-90s. And it basically dominates the space industry, just about every satellite out there now um, for near-Earth orbit and, and interplanetary orbit is powered by these, these triple junction solar cells. So we typically grow these by a process called MOVPE, metal organic vapor phase epitaxy. Sometimes it's called metal organic chemical vapor deposition. Um, there are other techniques, and uh, I'll mention one in a minute. Um, I'll mention two. MBE is one of them that a lot of people are, are familiar with. Um, I think there's MBE growth here at Spree. Um, and the other one is called HVP, which I'll say a word about in a minute. But MOCVD is, is at least for now, the, the sort of the, the industry standard. Uh, and it starts with these um, organometallic molecules. So you can see two examples. There's a tri -ga trimethyl gallium, so a gallium atom surrounded by these three um, methyl radicals and then are seen on the uh, group 5 site. Um, and you combine these at very high temperature, 600 to 800 degrees, where they decompose, they pyrolyze, um, and then you know, the uh, atoms land on the surface. And there's a very high thermodynamic driving force for crystallinity. You also have to consider kinetic effects. There's a lot of sort of chemical engineering that goes into good MOCVD. Uh, but if you get the temperature right and you get the flows right, you can get very, very good crystals, like I said. Um, the drawback to MOCVD is that they're based on very expensive metal organic sources. And that's sort of what keeps the costs pretty high. And so one of the newer techniques that, that we've been working on uh, at NREL for quite a number of years now is called hydride vapor phase epitaxy, HVPE. And it's based on using elemental sources on the group threes and higher growth rates. Um, so we're able to grow by MOCVD in the 6 to 10 microns per hour. Uh, HVPE has thus far demonstrated growth as high as 300 microns per hour. Okay, so that's a gallium arsenide cell in the amount of time it took me to say that sentence, which is pretty amazing. Um, so the hope going forward is that HVPE can be used to drive down costs of, of 3.5 cells. Uh, but for now, um, we have MO, MOVPE, and, and all the work that we did for this project is based on MOVPE. Um, you know, this is just a schematic of, of MOVPE looking at the surface, so you get these 
these trimethyl gallium atoms, trimethyl indium, trimethyl aluminum, phosphine, whatever they are, they've broken apart and they're landing on the surface and you can create layer by layer very highly crystalline structures. Okay, this is a, an image of a, an axitron system, um, much bigger than what we have on NREL at NREL, but the one on the picture on the left shows the platform where you can put wafers. So I think these are a six inch wafer and a bunch of four inch wafers. So, you know, it's still batch manufacturing um, rather than inline. You put everything in there and it all spins around. Um, and, you know, y then you switch batches and you put in new substrates. Um, so there are several companies that make these, these kinds of equipment. Okay, well, there's a lot of different applications for three fives, and I've shown some of them over here. Um, these are mostly one sun ish applications. Uh, rooftops, uh, flexible solars, solar cells that you might put on wings uh, or the front of a car, which is a, uh, an application that has uh, attracted some attention here at Spree. Um, but one sun is sort of a very particular operating point, and it, it's just based on conditions uh, of life on Earth. Um, but I think it's helpful sometimes to situate it in a larger landscape of operating points that you could parameterize with temperature and intensity, all right? So the color here is meant to, you know, very cartoonishly indicate efficiency that is low in the upper left and very high in the lower right. So as you increase the intensity, you raise the, you raise the efficiency. And as you lower the temperature, you generally raise the efficiency, right? Solar cells tend to operate better at lower temperatures. So one sun is smack in the middle of this plot, but there are other spaces that could be more useful. So the concentrator applications, HCPV stands for high concentration photovoltaics. Um, you know, 500 to 1,000 suns. Uh, low concentration photovoltaics has received some attention. Um, sun Power had a 7x concentrator for a while. Um, again, basically room temperature, but a higher concentration. Um, and then there's other applications here. Uh, some of the planetary applications are low temperature and low intensity. One could make three, five cells for that operating space uh, and so on. So the area that we're kind of most interested in, in this talk is this HCPV. Um, and, and so the question I have is, is, you know, what is this thing called concentrated photovoltaics, right? So, you know, you take a lens and you shine it and you make a concentrated spot and you put your solar cell there, all right? So in this picture, which I got from the internet, the concentration ratio would essentially be the ratio of this magnifying glass area to the area of the spot. So I don't know, that's probably somewhere between 50 and 100x maybe, all right? So you put a small solar cell at the focus of the lens, right? And there you, there, therefore you save money on, on the cell cost. You don't have to make a cell this big, you make a cell this big. And instead you sort of backfill the, the intensity or backfill the photons with a lens and, and, and concentrate the light. Okay, and these kinds of systems have been have been uh, developed commercially. So here's two examples um, of optics that have been commercialized. So the one on the left is a is a dish. It's a huge dish with a lot of different mirrors that all focus on the same solar cell that's sitting right up here. Can you see my mouse? That's sitting right up here in space. And the one on the right is a, a Fresnel concentrator. So it's a it's a flat machined concentrator that's circularly symmetric, and it refracts the light down to the solar cell. So th there has been sort of a, a nation industry built around concentrators that probably had its, its peak about 10 years ago. Um, but some of these are still in the field, uh, still producing power. Um, and we are hosting a conference in beginning of May called the CPV 16, the International Conference for Concentrated Photovoltaics in Golden, Colorado. If you want more information, I'd be happy to share it with you. Uh, so there's still some research uh, on the optics and the trackers and uh, lenses, cells, um, systems. Um, at the level of the cell performance, what happens is that the higher carrier density uh, from, the, from the higher concentration leads to a higher chemical potential, and therefore a higher VOC. So you get higher efficiency because your voltage goes up logarithmically with uh, intensity. Okay? From an economics point of view, the, the point in concentration is... Um, it, it, I mean, it drives down costs. So this is a model we had constructed for this project quite a number of years ago. We're looking at contours of efficiency uh, or contours of the, the dollars per watt as a function of efficiency and concentration. And what you see is that as you move to the upper right of the plot, uh, as you move to higher concentration, higher efficiency, the cost drives down. Of course, there's a lot of assumptions that go behind this modeling. But the value proposition of, of a concentrator system is that you save a lot of money on the cells by making them really small area. Um, 
and you, you gain in power because the efficiency is higher because of the concentration. So that's sort of the motivation for, for this work. And, and like I said at the beginning, we've been working on this at NREL for a long time. So how do we do better than a three-junction cell? I showed you that the plot on the left is the standard gallium indium phosphide, gallium arsenide, germanium, triple junction. How do we do better? And one way to do better is to access band gaps that are lower that are not at the same lattice constant. So we call this lattice mismatch. So for example, the four junction on the right has got these two junctions, gallium indium phosphide and gallium arsenide that are lattice matched gallium arsenide. And then we shift to a larger lattice constant for two successive junctions, okay? So we make a four junction device that's lattice mismatched. So what does lattice mismatch mean? So you're changing the lattice constant, okay? You have an epitaxial system with a crystallographic dimension and as you build up layers, right, you ideally match the epi layer to the same lattice constant as the substrate. If you don't do that, eventually you're going to create defects. And the best analogy that I can think of, and I should have brought a prop, is imagine you have a cardboard box of a certain size that's open on the top. And now you take another cardboard box that's bigger, and you try to ram the bigger one into the smaller one. Okay, so what do you have to do? You've got to scrunch it around the edges and stick it in there. And if it's a big enough cardboard box, then far enough away, the, the bigger one is going to look the way it should, right? You're going to not see the creases anymore, maybe if you do it right. But kind of at that interface, you've got a lot of bunching and scrunching and folding of the box, okay? So there's no way to accommodate the larger lattice on the smaller one without introducing some defects. And the science and engineering of this is figuring out how to accommodate those defects in a way that does not degrade the performance. So we do that with a compositionally graded buffer layer. And that's what I'm showing here. So here's the substrate. It's got some lateral dimension that is meant to uh, exemplify the lattice constants. And then we grow a series of these layers above it with successively increasing lattice constant, okay? So you start with one that's a little bit bigger and it's coherently strained, meaning it's, a, it's compressed in the, in the, ex, in the in plane direction. But eventually you get too much strain energy and it pops. Okay, and now you create a dislocation. And what you can see from the graph on the right is what a dislocation is. So if you count laterally, there's 11 atoms between the two vertical lines on the bottom, and there's 10 atoms on top. And I can pause for a moment if everybody wants to count, um, or you can take my word for it. But right in the middle, there's an extra atom, and that's called a dislocation. And a dislocation, does, you cannot end a dislocation in the middle of the crystal. So you have this crystallographic dislocation. And depending on where it sits in the, in the cell, it can either be innocuous or it can be a non-rated recombination site. So what we try to do is engineer it so that most of the dislocations that are created when you change the lattice constant are either confined to the interfaces of the step grade or if they turn vertically and become threads, then they glide to the outsides. Okay, so in this graph or in this schematic, you see lines that are parallel to the planes. Those are misfits. And then segments of the line that have turned up here, 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 those are called threading dislocations. And if they thread all the way through the active regions, that's deleterious. That creates a non-rated recombination site that lowers your voltage, all right? So what we try to do is use the energy of the growth, the thermal energy of the growth, to force those threading dislocations to the sides of the crystal so that we end up with strain-free, dislocation-free material at the top, okay? So how do you get threads to glide? Well, I said, you try to use the energy of the system to push them aside. Now, if you have beautiful interfaces and, and, and everything flat, then they glide very nicely, okay? So here's a thread. It's being pushed very nicely to the side of the, of the, of the crystal. In fact, real crystals don't look like that. You know, even with the best epitaxial system, you still have roughness, you have inclusions, you have, you know, defects. And those can serve the role of pinning the dislocations. So in real systems, you end up with threads that are stuck, all right? And they go all the way to the top. And here you can see some examples of, of what that could look like. So these are, uh, this is a transmission electron micrograph in the middle. And on the bottom, you see the substrate. On the top, you see what should be the active layer um, and a compositionally graded buffer in the middle. And it, you know, if you look, you can see there's threading dislocations and, and misfit dislocations all through this area. But the layer on top is actually pretty free of these dislocations. So we've done a good job here of, of, uh, of clearing them out and making good quality material. If you look from the top with a different technique called EBIC, electron beam induced current, and here what you do is you have um, probes attached to it, so you're and then you shine light and you, you raster the light around. So the light gets absorbed in a spot, and if it's a spot that is good material quality that creates photocurrents, um, 
then you know you have a unit of current. And if it's a non-radiative recombination site, you get a dark spot. So you can count the threading dislocations by counting the dots. All right, and here it's about 10 to the 6 per square centimeter. Um, this is another example. Uh, I think my colleague John Geis actually grew these more for their pedagogical value. He grew one with high tensile strain and one with high compress compressive strain to illustrate what can go right and what can go wrong. So the one on the left is a TM of a, of a uh, structure that's in residual compressive stress. And you can see that the top layer is actually pretty nice. Whereas the one on the right is grown in tensile strain, which doesn't do as good a job of forcing the dislocations to the sides. And so you have these threading dislocations that are kind of penetrating up and through the material here. All right. And this has consequences for the performance of the cell. Um, so the graph on the left is, is, for, is from a, a thesis at Ohio State University quite a number of years ago. And, and, and the, the student, Carrie Andre, looked at the VOC as a function of threading dislocation density. So she engineered these cells that, that you know, purposely added threads. And you know, the main point is that low threads, you have a, a flat VOC. And then as you increase the threads, you start to logarithmically drop your performance. And we've seen that at NREL. So, so these are gallium indium arsenide cells. Um, at 1 EV, so we've graded, you know, however many percent uh, increase in the lattice constants. And if you do this with um, high threading dislocation density, mid 10 to the 6, you, you get, you know, some VOC. And if you do it with lower threading dislocation density, you get a higher VOC. So you can see the change in performance in the IV curves, and you can see it structurally in a cathodoluminescence or EBIC or TEM. So lots of different characterization techniques. And, and lots of different ways of, of looking at the electrical performance. And, and it seems that the boundary between good enough and not quite good enough is about 10 to the 6. And we've become pretty good at this at NREL, if I can say so. Uh, we've spent a long time uh, engineering these grades. Um, many people have contributed to this. Um, this is uh, an image that I took from one of Ryan France's papers. <laughs> And uh, what he did here is he made a series of in-gas cells on gallium indium phosphide buffers. So we start with a gallium arsenide cell, and we grade the step grade with you know, an increasing indium fraction in the gallium indium phosphide. And then at the final layer that we're, we're targeting, we grow a gallium indium arsenide cell. Okay? So gallium indium phosphide buffer, gallium indium arsenide cell. All right? And there's a range of cells here. There's seven or eight cells of different indium compositions, and therefore different lattice constants, and therefore different band gaps. And what you see here, if you measure the quantum efficiency of all these, is that the internal quantum efficiency is above 90% across the board. Okay, So we've made pretty good carrier collection in these lattice mismatch cells all across the board. And you know this one over here, this red one, this is a 4% misfit from gallium arsenide. You're changing the lattice constant by over 4%. In fact, the red one goes a little bit beyond indium phosphate. You're grading with gallium indium phosphate all the way to indium phosphate, and then a little bit further on with indium, it's either indium phosphate and timonide, I think, or indium arsenide phosphate, a little bit further than indium phosphate, and we're still maintaining pretty good quality all the way to the end. All right, so the threading dislocation density is kind of below 10 to the 6 for the whole range. And the WOC, if you're familiar with that metric, it's the band gap voltage offset. It's sort of a metric for material quality where 0.4 is kind of taken as the rule of thumb for the division between good cells and bad cells. It's, it's, you know, it's actually not uh, flat with, um, with band gap. The WOC in the radiative limit actually changes. But 0.4 is a pretty good limit. And what you can see is for these um, lattice mismatched in gas cells, we're kind of at or below 0.4 pretty much across the range. So we've done a good job of engineering the, the lattice mismatch here. So what does this look like in the context of a cell? All right, so this is a schematic for a four junction. And, and I'm going back and using some old slides that, that exemplify the, the point. You know, we could redraw this for a six junction, but the, the, the concept, I think, is adequately conveyed here, where you have two lattice match junctions at the top and then a graded buffer, and then a third junction that's mismatched, and then another graded buffer, and then a fourth junction that's mismatched, OK? And we grow this from top to bottom. So we start with the high band gap cell and then grow to the bottom. And so we call it an inverted metamorphic junction. Now, you could grow it from the bottom to the top. You could start with a, with a gallium arsenide or germanium uh, substrate. But then you'd have to increase the lattice constants. And then you'd grow the bottom cell. And then you'd have to decrease the lattice constants. And then you'd grow the third cell, and then decrease, and so on. And what's the problem with that? Well, that means that all of your junctions are lattice mismatched. right? So 
even with the best engineering of your compositional graded buffer, you're probably not going to get better material quality than the substrate. And if you grow this from the bottom to the top, then every single one of your junctions is going to have a higher threading dislocation than the substrate, including the top junction, which is the most power producing, right? Because if you have the same current going through, but a higher voltage, then you have more power. So in terms of the power production, the top cell is the most important, followed by the second, third, fourth, okay? So, and, and there, are, there are places in the world that grow upright cells, and they do very well. Um, our feeling at NREL is that if we want to get the very best material quality, let's restructure the, the growth so that you grow the most important, heavily power producing subcells first with really good material quality, and then invert it during processing so that it's oriented correctly. Does that make sense? So this is what it looks like. This is another slide from, from some time ago for a three junction, but it's same thing. You grow gallium arsenide, you start with gallium arsenide, and then you grow the top cell, then the 1.4 EV gas cell, then the grade, then the bottom cell. And then in processing, you flip it over, okay? You bond it to some kind of mechanical handle, and then you etch off the substrate and put on contacts and do your MESA isolation and, and measure it, okay? So in the final analysis, it's oriented correctly with the high band gap cell on top and the low band gap cell on the bottom, but that's not how we started, okay? There are some ancillary benefits to this inverted technology, one of which is that you have to remove the substrate, which means you can make something lightweight, all right? So you could remove a 350 micron substrate and you end up with, you know, whatever, 10, 20 microns of semiconductor material, depending on the thickness, but that's considerably lighter. So for space applications, that's huge. The second thing is you can bond this to whatever handle you want. So we typically use inert silicon, but you could bond it to glass if you wanted something transparent. You could bond it to metal foil, you could bond it to balsa wood, whatever you want, okay? So you have the ability to make it transparent and lightweight. And because the last layer grown is the back contact, you can also bond it to something that's highly reflective or you can evaporate or electroplate a highly reflective back contact. That's what we do. So we evaporate, we electroplate highly reflective gold as the back contact. And in addition to making a back electrical contact, that highly reflective back contact also changes the optics of the solar cell, right? So it increases our photon recycling, or it lets us thin the bottom cell by a factor of two, which reduces bulk recombination. So in the context of a 6J, you know, there's not a lot of photon recycling in that bottom cell. But, you know, for other applications, we have made gallium arsenide and gallium indium phosphide single junction cells with a lot of enhanced photon recycling. And you can really push the limits of a, of a gallium arsenide cell in that way. And, you know, so that, that sort of that inverted platform, even though it was originally developed for these lattice mismatch cells, we have used to good effect for basically all of our cells now at NREL. All right, and so here's some IV curves from previous work. We have 2J, a 3J, a 4J was over 45%. How high could we go with a 6J? So the goals of this project were to hit a 50% efficiency. Um, that, was our, that was our plan, to set out and make a 50% uh, efficient cell at about 1,000 suns. So let's see how we did. So this is the structure that we ultimately fabricated. Right? It's got three lattice match junctions, and then a grade, and then a junction, then a grade, then a junction, then a grade, then a final junction. All right? And it's probably worth pointing out that there are other form factors that one could have used. Right? You could have grown the three cells, and then one long grade to the indium phosphide lattice constant, and then three lattice mismatch cells, or some permutation on that. Right? One grade, and then two cells, and then a second grade, and then a last cell. Um, we, we explored, in some way, a lot of these different uh, possibilities. Um, you know, this is kind of our baseline that we have sort of expanded from the 4J into, right? Three distinct grades with three distinct junctions. You know, if you try to grow one long and then three lattice mismatch cells, you're really growing all three bottom cells at the same, uh, you know, highly lattice mismatched, probably not quite as good uh, material quality junction. So this in the end gave us the best material quality. So here you see the three top cells. And then gallium indium phosphide grade, fourth cell, gallium indium phosphide grade, fifth cell, gallium indium phosphide grade, bottom cell. And there are a lot of material science challenges here, and I'm just going to touch on a couple of them uh, in subsequent slides. So the top two junctions contain aluminum. You start with aluminum gallium indium phosphide at 2.1 EV, and then aluminum gallium arsenide at about 1.7. So that aluminum can be problematic. Aluminum tends to getter oxygen. Oxygen forms a deep level trap in three fives, 
and you know deep level trap is smack in the middle of the band gap and so you know if you if you wanted a defect whose energetics would be the worst in terms of non radiative recombination it's hard to beat oxygen um, so that's one of the problems with aluminum you know you need transparent tunnel junctions for all of them uh, anytime you have a non transparent tunnel junction that's a parasitic loss you know we've talked at some length here about the metamorphic growth uh, so there's there's you know even more challenges as you go to longer miscuts mi uh, mismatches uh, there's a lattice mismatch tunnel junction uh, and of course this is meant to be a concentrator and it's got to operate at high concentration so you got to mitigate series resistance so I'll talk about a couple of these uh, this is a TEM that we took of the bottom cell and you know I've glossed over I'm going to gloss over some details here um, the main one I'm going to kind of neglect for the purposes of, of simplicity in this talk is that you know the substrate can be miscut to 6a or miscut to the b direction you know in a, in a silicon in a silicon cell it's it's or it's, it's iso well, not isotropic but but there's you know if you look along the 110 directions they're the same in either direction here if you miscut one way you expose steps with arsenic terminated uh, step edges and in the other way you have gallium terminated step edges and th those will change the phase separation and the degree of incorporation of dopants um, and it will change the compositionally graded buffer layers that you use and we, we kind of explored both of them but in both cases the bottom graded buffer was a gallium indium phosphide and in fact we went further with indium arsenide phosphide to access uh, an ingas that was even beyond indium phosphide so here you see a TEM uh, with pretty good material quality in the fifth junction uh, and then a tunnel junction and then we've done a good job of isolating the defects to the graded buffer right here's the gallium indium phosphide portion of the graded buffer and then the indium phosphide and timonide and then at the very bottom of this TM you can see the bottom cell of the 6J and it's again got pretty good material quality so 4% lattice mismatch and we're getting pretty good material quality um, this is an in situ strain measurement that we call MOS, uh, multi beam optical stress sensor. And it's during the growth. And what you do is you shine a three by three array of lasers down on your substrate and they reflect back. Okay, now if you're growing strain free at whatever growth temperature, then the lasers bounce straight back up and you don't measure any deflection. But if you pick up strain, either tensile strain, right, that's folding up the cell, then you deflect the lasers in, or compressive strain that deflects the lasers out, you can see that. And you can measure it in two dimensions, right? Because I said it's a three by three array. So you can use these ones to measure this way and these ones to measure this way. And what you're seeing here is that we have pretty good um, control over the strain properties uh, during the growth. Okay, so this is the top cell, it's flat. This is the second cell, it's flat. The third cell, it's flat. We have the first grade, so we're, we're you know, uh, intentionally introducing strain and strain relaxation so we expect to see some changes but the fourth junction is basically flat it's not quite flat actually it's isotropic it, it's it's got some you know this one goes this way and this one goes this way but the net stress is is, is flat which is good enough uh, and then the fifth junction is flat and the sixth junction is flat so you know over 400 minutes or whatever it is 450 minutes you can divide by 60 and find out how the number of hours uh, of growth we're getting pretty good control over the strain properties of this thing Okay, so about halfway through our program, we made a 6J. Uh, here's the IQE um, from top cell on the left to bottom cell on the right. We're getting pretty good collection in the 90% range. Um, if you do electroluminescence on these, so here you inject current and you look at the light that's coming out of the diode, you can see each of the junctions. For a single junction, electroluminescence you know, has its, its value in terms of mapping and looking for defects. Um, but you know, you measure the dark IV, you get the voltage of the cell. For a multi-junction cell, if you measure the dark IV, you get the total voltage, but you can't differentiate the junctions. But electroluminescence lets you peer into it, right? Because you have, if you've spaced the junctions out correctly, you have a unique emission from each junction. And if you do some math on the measured electroluminescence spectrum, you can translate that into a dark IV. So you see six distinct peaks from the junctions right one for each junction and we can translate that into the external radiative efficiency uh, or into the dark IV and the dark IV is really useful because you know you we know what the voltage of each cell should be and this is a way of measuring what it actually is um, so what you see here on the right is our calculation from those data of the dark IV of these junctions 
And I think the most important thing here is that if you look at the dashed lines, those are guides to the eye of n equals 1 ideality, is they're all n equals 1 at high current density. All right, this blue one, this al gas cell, seems to be largely n equals 2, maybe the gas as well, at low current densities. But the top junction and all the lattice mismatch are nice n equals 1 diodes at high current densities, um, which is a really good development. OK, let me talk a little bit about the, about the top cell. The top cell sort of has a unique place in that um, the emitter of the top cell has to do two things. It's part of the junction, so it has to help separate carriers. But it also has to spread majority carriers uh, from the, you know, the semiconductor to the contacts. So it has minority carrier properties, and it has majority carrier properties. The rest of the junctions don't really have that majority carrierness. The rest of the junctions are involved with separating the carriers right, to create the photovoltaic effect, but the current is largely going vertically. Right? But at the top, you have to spread it. Now, for a gallium arsenide cell, there's very good mobility. For even a gallium indium phosphide cell, there's very good mobility uh, for majority carrier uh, electrons. Okay? But for an aluminum gallium indium phosphide cell, as you add aluminum, uh, you really reduce the majority carrier properties. So there was a question of what to do about this top cell. So here, for example, this is data that was taken by Emmett Pearl when he was a grad student at NREL. Um, we've made a series of aluminum gallium indium phosphide cells with higher and higher band gap. Right? We're trying to push up to about 2.1, maybe even 2.15 here. And you can make those cells. And so you know, I like this, uh, this photo with four different compositions of aluminum. And you can see the luminescence going from uh, pink at 1.9 EV all the way up to green at 2.17. Um, but the material quality starts to degrade. But even as the material, even before the material quality starts to degrade, as you add aluminum, the mobility really starts to drop. Okay, and that's going to affect the majority carrier properties as well. And because this is a concentrator cell, if we don't have the series resistance under control, then the efficiency rolls over, and we don't get as efficient uh, cell as we want. So you know, one possibility is that you simply crank up the doping in the aluminum gallium phosphide cell. But that doesn't really work. So on the left, what you can see is a series of aluminum gallium indium phosphide homojunction cells, meaning the emitter and the base are both 18% aluminum gallium phosphide, about 2.1 EV. And what you see here is that as you raise the doping, where's my cursor? From here, you get a 1,900 or so ohms per square. You raise the doping, you get a lower sheet resistance. You raise the doping, you get an even lower sheet resistance. That's very nice. We're controlling the series resistance. But the blue response is dropping. Okay. So another possibility is that you lower the composition of aluminum. Okay? So here we go 6% here we go 18% aluminum high sheet resistance. 12% aluminum half the sheet resistance. 6% aluminum a third the sheet resistance. And we really haven't changed the QE at all. So lowering the sheet resistance by lowering the aluminum composition has maintained the minority carrier properties, but because it's raised the mobility, it's also allowed us to reduce the series resistance. And we call that a reverse heterojunction. And you, know, you might think that, that the problem here is that you're going to lose all that voltage. So if we go from an aluminum gallium indium phosphide homojunction, and then we substitute the emitter with a gallium indium phosphide emitter, that we're going to drop all the way down to 1.8 volts in terms of voltage. And that is not what happens. So here you see the quantum efficiency of two cells. The red is an aluminum gallium indium phosphide, and the black is a gallium indium phosphide. And then this green one is a, is a reverse heterojunction. So it's got an aluminum gallium indium phosphide base and a gallium indium phosphide emitter. It's got a lower band gap emitter on the front. Okay, and that's what you see with this tail here. But the voltage is only somewhere in the middle. So we've dropped the band gap of the top cell, thereby lowering the sheet resistance, and we've only lost some of the voltage. Okay, and you can see that both the emitter and the the base are contributing to the, um, to the voltage because there are two peaks in the electroluminescence. So you know, when is this most helpful? Well, if you have a very, so here I've constructed sort of a simulation with a 1J and a 4J and a 6J and an 8J. And I definitely don't want you to go home thinking that we're now working on 8J cells. The point is that you have sort of a higher and higher voltage as you move up on this plot. And so you know, the question is, is, when is this reverse heterojunction useful? So at very low current densities, you don't have a huge resistance problem. right? And, and so one possibility is that you simply tighten up the grids. Okay? So you're going to lose power when you tighten the grids because of shadowing. But if you don't have a lot of currents, then that shadowing is not all that bad. As you get to higher and higher uh, 
intensities, right? You, you, at some point, you have so much shadowing that the shadowing itself becomes a bigger power loss than the voltage loss. And so at that point, you would want to cross over to this reverse heterojunction. And what you find here is that as you increase the voltage of this cell, so if you go from a 1J with, you know, whatever it is, 1.4 volts, um, all the way up to a 6J with 5.5 volts and then an 8J, is that this crossover moves back, okay? It moves to lower intensities. And that makes sense because, you know, the voltage loss there is a smaller fraction of the total. All right, so the reason, you know, we chose the reverse heterojunction for our 6J is that we were hoping to operate up here in the 1,000 uh, suns range. Um, okay, so our initial concentrator results kind of looked like this. You know, everything looked beautiful at one sun, uh, but we were starting to see these barriers inside that, that typified a, a hetero barrier. And when we dug into it, what we found is that we had one interface between gallium-indium phosphide at the back of the fourth junction, uh, an interface between that and, you know, well, two interfaces between that and the gallium-indium arsenide cell on one side and the tunnel junction on the other, where zinc was really spilling away from the gallium-indium phosphide and into the layers. And it was causing this profile that looked not at all what we wanted. You know, ideally, you'd want this to be flat. And, you know, this is, was, was uh, evidence of a hetero barrier. And we spent a lot of time trying to engineer around this. So, you know, if you increase the thickness of a spacer layer, it got a little bit better. If you increase the band gap and the spacing of a spacer layer, it got a lot better. And this, you know, I'm going over this quickly in one slide, but this actually consumed a year of our lives. To um, and so in the end, uh, we made some record efficiency cells. So this is the external quantum efficiency of our, f of our best 6J, and it's color coded. So this has an AR coding on it, okay? So with the losses of the AR coding and everything else that's going on inside, we're getting above 80% collection across the whole range uh, above 90% for some of the cells, and pretty good reflection uh, from the ARC. Uh, we made two versions of the cell. At one sun, with, you know, with a large uh, wide grids you know, and, and a small bus bar, uh, we were able to make a record 39.2% cell. Um, so you know, everybody has 40% in mind as, as the target, right? People celebrate their 40th birthdays. They don't celebrate their 39th birthdays. But you know, there's really no difference. This is a, a really good uh, one sun result um, with really good external radiative efficiency you know, in all six of the junctions. Um, and then at, concentrator, this, at concentration, this uh, demonstrated 47% at 143 suns. And I would note here that you know, one thing you can control is, is the grid pitch. And as you tighten the grid pitch, you, know, you, you lower the current a little bit because of shadowing, but you mitigate series resistance just a little bit more. And, um, and that means that you can maintain a high efficiency to even higher concentration. So the very best cell peaked at 47% at 143 suns, but other cells maintained over 40, just about 45% all the way up to 1,000 suns. So the point really is that you have, you have cells that you can design for a very wide range of, of concentrations uh, that one could deploy out in the field and maintain very high efficiency. Um, so these are both on the charts. And um, like I said, this has been a three and a half year project that was funded by Department of Energy. So you know, we're eternally grateful for their funding and support. And um, you know, thank you so much for your attention. I'll leave it here. Thank you very much, Miles. Brilliant results. We have time for one question. Who's got a question? Uh, thank you, that was very, very interesting. One thing that has always caught my attention is why is it that the N equals 1 kicks in at such high current densities? Based on theory, you should not have recombination in the depletion region uh, at this high current densities. Can you explain to me why the N equals 1 occurs so at such high current densities in 3 fives? <coughs> Well, you, you, right, so you're saying that why do you have n equals 2 at all at one sun? Yeah. Um, no, I've never thought about why do you, so I, I, right, I guess in silicon, you're, you're, you're n equals 1 down to low current densities. I think yeah. the Shockley, I mean, the cross-section for Shockley-Reed-Hall recombination is just different in the three fives. Um, so you, you get, you know, you get recombination in the depletion region at the lower voltages. I mean, we see that basically in every cell. You know, at really low intensities, your n equals two, up till about, you know, if you're lucky in gallium arsenide, your crossover is a little bit below one sun, and at one sun voltages, you've already crossed over into mostly n equals one. 
uh, and then at higher. Um, yeah, I think it has to do with the carrier co the cross section for um, holes and electrons to recombine. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, Miles, our time's up. So thank you so much for sure. some really amazing results. Congratulations. Thank you.